Hey YouTube, it's Auntie Mickey. How you doing this evening? Um, hit the like button as you enter. Share the video. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. I'm going to go ahead and proceed to read chapter 14 from the book. Who are you calling a who are you calling a white girl? Don't play with me. Touchy subject here. Chapter 14, The New Millennium. The years seem to literally take flight and soar by. Two weeks after my wedding, Daddy, Daddy suddenly decided to marry this new woman he had met while I was in California, but despite his greatest efforts to make this marriage work, it only lasted about five years. The bitterness from his divorce, along with the obligation of taking care of Mama, took its toll on him, both physically and emotionally. Family life and careers were rather time-consuming as well. I found a stable job with the Port of Seattle, and Barry accepted his personal calling to preach and pastor a church. The boys were growing like weeds. Marty and Larry divorced and she moved out of state. Daddy and I were eventually on speaking terms again, although neither one of us would dare bring up the subject of our past, let alone attempt to address those issues surrounding the erosion of our relationship. I sensed a willingness on his part to patch things up when one Sunday afternoon I brought Marty by to visit before her move to California. His whole demeanor seemed to instantly change in her presence. Unlike Grandpa, social conversation was never Daddy's strongest attribute. But we must have laughed and talked for about two hours. It meant so much to hear him say that he was proud of me for the very first time, ever. And Daddy expressed how happy he was to see that Marty and I were so close stopping short of any admittance of regret for taking a stand against Grandpa's intent of adopting her and raising us together as sisters under the same roof. As Mama was fast approaching 90, her mind slowly slipped into the early stages of dementia and her body became physically compromised with frailty. Daddy didn't hide his sentiments that he was tired of taking care of her and as she became more and more like a child, he treated her as such. Just as children sometimes master the manipulation game and pit their parents against each other in order to get their, get their way and what they want, Mama began to display some of those same characteristics. With my experience in raising my two sons, it wasn't difficult for me to recognize it. There were instances when Mama would do something that displeased him, and out of sheer frustration, he would sometimes threaten to move her into a rest home. That's when she would then call me to intervene. This was a major point of contention between Daddy and I, and because not only did Mama have a tremendous fear of rest homes, getting extremely agitated at the very subject, but I was always taught that culturally, Black folks just don't put their old folks away. It was unfortunate, but I began to understand why Grandpa preferred me to take care of her over Daddy. Then one evening, as she made her way from the bathroom to her bed, she slipped and fell on the floor and wasn't able to get herself up. She laid there on the floor for hours until Daddy arrived for his routine check on her the next morning. It was then that all three of us decided that she couldn't live alone any longer. The rest home, however, was completely out of the question. So I researched other possibilities for her, and I found an adult family home with a wonderful, loving caregiver named Miss Hetty. We moved her in there in two weeks. She had been living at Miss Hetty's for about a year, and, and life went well. Miss Hetty was very attentive to Mama's basic needs, such as meals and laundry, and between Daddy and I, we made sure that she was entertained. 
Mama always took pride in her appearance, so I would visit her on a regular basis to press and curl her hair. I also took her out for her favorite pastime, shopping at Goodwill. I enjoyed those times with her, especially since the boys were in high school by then. As typical teenagers usually do, they disappeared into their friends, girlfriends, and extracurricular activities. Barry was also extremely busy with his pastoral duties and church activities, added to the mix of working full-time for the Seattle School District. This left me with a lot of spare time on my hands. Although I loved my solitude, I recognized the importance of savoring any remaining time that Mama had left on this earth. At first, she complained of a pain in her stomach, but this wasn't completely out of the norm for Mama. For as long as I can remember, she took X-Lax or Epsom salt or something like that on a regular basis. You got to get the poison out your system, baby, she would say. Old folks seemed to be obsessed with staying regular. And Mama was the poster child for the bowel movement. <laughs> Daddy and I shrugged it off as Mama just being Mama. But when the persistent pain was soon accompanied with blood in her stool, we agreed that she should be seen by a doctor immediately. Mama wasn't too keen on doctors since her operation in the late 60s when the surgeon found a piece of small sponge left behind from a previous surgery performed years earlier in Nashville. So I'd like to think that it took some heavy convincing on my part to get her to go agree to go to the hospital. However, quite frankly, I think, I think it was daddy's strong arm tactics that ultimately worked. The doctors found polyps on her colon. It was a fairly simple ailment, even for a woman her age and treatable under normal circumstances, but it was what they found in her stomach that caused the greatest alarm. It was determined for the last 20 years, she carried an aneurysm that grew into the size of a grapefruit, which caused her stomach pain. Mama was 93 by then, so an operation would have most likely killed her. If she knew about it, that would have killed her too. Before her diagnosis, I would come by to visit and find her sitting quietly in her dark room, patting her foot to no particular beat and just waiting, just waiting and silently praying as if she was waiting to die. Sometimes it would take a few seconds for her to realize that I was standing in the doorway, but once she realized it, her eyes would literally light up. She would smile and say, Hi, sweetie. The doctors were telling us that it would be a matter of time, months maybe, before the aneurysm would rupture. And when it did, she would die immediately, without warning. There was no question in our minds that it would be best not to tell her. Let her live the rest of her days in peace. We took her back home where she quiet, quietly went on about her life, waiting. Deep down inside, I'm sure she knew that her time was drawing near. It gave me peace to know that she prepared herself for that day many years ago. All she had to do was wait. The new millennium was upon us. The media pumped up the possibilities of total devastation with the transition to the new year of 2000 and the world would simply wait to see the outcome. New Year's Eve of 1999 displayed each country's celebration on television in real time and I remained fixated on the festivities around the clock, ignoring the fact that I needed to be at work very early the next day. Of course, New Year's Day went without a hitch, and to the surprise of many, the world didn't come to an end. But at 4.30 a.m. the next morning, the world as I knew it ceased to exist.
My emotional defenses went into high gear instantly as I knew something was wrong from the mere fact that the phone was ringing at that hour. When I answered, it was Daddy. His voice was barely audible as he asked, Are you awake? I am now, I replied. What's wrong? Without the slightest build-up or hesitation, he bluntly said, Mama's dead. Strangely enough, my first thought was, wow, she made it to see the new millennium. He gave me a few minor details about what took place. After a few minutes, I told him to meet me at Miss Nettie's house, but he said he couldn't come right away. Barely dressing appropriately, Barry and I jumped into the car and drove over to Miss Nettie's house to find Mama lying on her bed with the heart monitor still attached to her chest. Apparently, Mama got out of the bed that morning to use the bathroom and dropped right there in the doorway. Miss Nettie had recently begun sleeping in Mama's room with her and said the fall caused her to wake up in time to find Mama on the floor with a look of confusion in her eyes, wondering what was happening to her. She then slowly closed her eyes and went to sleep for good. Her hands were still warm as I held them. As I stood over her lifeless body, Miss Nettie and Barry left the room, shutting the door behind them. It was just Mama and I, with no one else to hear or see us. It should have been my opportunity to say whatever I needed to say but words seemed meaningless at that point and would have only served as protocol. In the movies, when a character lost a loved one that they truly loved, a good actor could play out the scene in such a way as to compel the audience to feel those deep-seated emotions of pain and loss, putting themselves in the character's place. But this was no movie and I was no actor. My mind tried to feel the guilt. My heart tried to feel the sadness that one would expect to feel, but all I felt was confusion. Was I that prepared for her passing? Not by a long shot. No matter how much you prepare, you're never truly prepared for the loss of a loved one. Make of it what you will. Those expected feelings of deep pain and emptiness within my soul just didn't exist as they did when Grandpa died naturally. I was sad to lose her. She was the only mother I knew, and we adored each other very much, yet I felt at peace. To anyone else, this would have seemed quite unnatural. How do I explain joy and death to my boys? Although they were almost grown, they hadn't been this close to losing a loved one since Grandpa. And they too were too young to really understand it back then. It wasn't until after I kissed her forehead and said goodbye that the explanation revealed itself to me just like a child learning something new for the very first time. I felt comfort in where her soul was destined to go. And though there were many tears, some selfishly for me, but mostly for the thought of my boys and the pain they would feel. Although they didn't see Mama very much, they loved her tremendously and she loved them. It just wasn't the same as when Grandpa died. I loved him with all my heart. He was my confidant, my best friend, and all the other acronyms one would refer to someone as close as we were. But in the same token, he wasn't the most godly person. <laughs> he wasn't the most godly person you'd ever know. 
It wasn't until my mama died that I realized my sadness for grandpa reached far beyond missing him with me on this earth. The agony was compounded by the fear of where he was headed. There was no question in my heart that mama made it into heaven. But I could only pray that grandpa made his peace in the end before he left this earth. God only knows. I called the funeral home to have them pick up the body, then waited for them to arrive. About an hour later, Daddy finally showed up and hesitated to enter her room. He took a deep breath and finally entered, but stopped short of walking over to her bed. He just stood there in the doorway and looked over at her, still covered by the sheet. He began to turn away, but I stopped him and turned him back around. I walked him over to where she laid, uncovered her body, then turned to leave the room. Before I could close the door so he could spend time alone with her, I turned to see him on his knees at her bedside, silently weeping. And for the first time, I felt genuinely sorry for him. It suddenly occurred to me that even, through, even though he spent the last 13 years complaining about having to take care of her out of obligation, she was the only one that depended on him, which gave him purpose. With her gone, what would he do with his time now? Daddy stayed for about 30 minutes and left before the funeral home attendants arrived to pick up her body. I suspect he couldn't take seeing them carry her out in that body bag the way they did Grandpa. One of the attendants was pretty up in age himself, and I couldn't imagine why they would send someone out who could barely walk to pick up a dead body. As they placed her on the gurney and strapped her down, the two attendants hoisted the gurney standing upright as they attempted to maneuver her out of the small bedroom. That's when the older one accidentally dropped his end. I only thank God that my sons weren't there to see this because under the circumstances, I'm sure they would have both went off on those attendants. Fortunately, Barry stepped in and assisted the younger attendant in carrying her out to the van as the older one uselessly stood there. A few minutes later, they were gone. I went in there to her room to retrieve a few of her personal items that I would need for her service and we left soon after. It was time to break the news to the boys. The mere thought of this made me weep like a baby. I prayed for God to give me the strength to do what I needed to do. As I've always done in the past, I relied on humor to get me through some tough situations. This was one of the toughest situations I could have ever imagined, and I needed a little bit more than a few wisecracks or punchlines to get me through it. I called on one of Daddy's friends, Miss Norma. She was an old woman around 70-ish and lived in a small two-bedroom apartment in a building that used to be a boarding house many years ago. She shared a bathroom with two other tenants but never used it because she was bound to a wheelchair as a result of being stricken with polio when she was just a teenager. Miss Norma sold every pill in the book. Vicodin, Valium, Percocet, and even Oxycontin. Daddy was a regular customer of hers. And they became pretty close friends over the years. Needless to say, she became a friend of mine as well. She gave me a handful of Valium and sent me on my way. I'm not ashamed to say that it was her volume that kept my nerves in check in order to proceed with what I needed to do for Mama. I went to the funeral home to prepare her for the wake. When I finished her makeup, she was absolutely stunning. Even the funeral home attendants said she didn't look dead at all. She just looked like she was asleep. Just as he did when Grandpa died, 
Daddy elected not to get involved with the funeral arrangements. So I made the preparations, told him the time and place of the service, and all he had to do was show up. The service was short and sweet, and once again, I felt sad for those of us left behind, especially Daddy as he wept through the whole service. The boys held up extremely well, all grown up and being strong for us all. As they had grown up to look very much like Daddy. When he was a young man, it was especially touching to see him with his arm around his grandfather, silently comforting him as he wept. I was so proud of Junebug who spoke up so beautifully on Mama's behalf. Then as I had always promised her, I do. I sang, Precious Lord. But most precious of all was Barry. Through it all, he was my rock. Years back, it was Barry they didn't want me to be with. Years back, it was Barry that took the most heat from my family. Yet it was Barry that was there through my most difficult times. All of the attributes they envisioned for me and a man were there all along. Just wrapped into a different colored package. Whew, that was another rough one. <laughs> okay, I think I got it back together. And once again, I apologize for the tears. But it's like reliving it. Just like it was yesterday. So again, I want to thank y'all for listening. Uh, next time I make a recording, it will be chapter 15. And the title will be Snapped. I don't know if there's going to be any tears in that chapter. Y'all, thanks for listening. God bless. Peace.